Okay, so let's move on and talk about bleeding disorders. Let's start with platelets. So platelets have a five-day storage life. Uh, one unit of platelets is derived from a whole unit of blood, and it typically will raise the recipient's platelet count by about 10,000. Um, when people talk about a platelet phoresis pack, it contains about six units of platelets, and it's derived from a single donor, so people sometimes refer to it as a six-pack of platelets. And you want to give ABO-compatible platelets whenever possible because there can be a small amount of RBCs that contaminates the platelet pack. So what are some causes of thrombocytopenia or decreased platelet function? Well, the usual stuff, so production, destruction, and sequestration. So causes of decreased platelet production, so aplastic anemia, lots of uh, viral infections can cause bone marrow aplasia, lots of drugs suppress platelet function, um, ethanol, thiazides, estrogens, chemo, heparin, or you can destroy platelets. So ITP, TTP, HUS, DIC, uh, drugs, for example, HIT associated with heparin can cause increased platelet destruction. And then finally, splenic sequestration. So if you have hypersplenism, you can rapidly and prematurely destroy RBCs and platelets, and some medical conditions can cause this. For example, malaria, rheumatoid arthritis, or TB. If you have splenomegaly, you can hold half of your blood volume and 90% of your platelets in there. And platelet loss, uh, so things like bleeding or hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement can cause direct platelet loss. So what are some consequences of thrombocytopenia? So we talked about the role of platelets. So this is to agglutinate um, when not in the lumen of a blood vessel and releases factors that trigger this intrinsic limb of the clotting cascade that Aaron had talked about. So normal range for platelets are 150 to 450,000. And you know why do we worry when it gets low? Well, when it's less than 10,000, you can get spontaneous um, hemorrhage, right? And this could be really bad, particularly in the brain. Um, when you're about 10 to 30,000, you can get spontaneous petechiae and bruising, and then 30 to 50,000, you get excessive bruising with trauma. Um, so again, it's just, it's important to uh, think about because, you know, it, you have to intervene, particularly when platelets are less than 10,000. What about purpura? So we addressed this a little bit before. If you have non-palpable purpura, this is typically platelets that are numerically low or dysfunctional. Uh, if you have palpable purpura, that's a different ballgame when you're typically thinking here about an angiopathy or a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Causes of dysfunctional platelets, which increase the bleeding time, uh, a rarely performed but uh, functional platelet test. Things like aspirin, right, which is, uh, inhibits platelet function for the life of the platelet. NSAIDs, which work only as long as they're in the bloodstream. Drugs like teclodipine or clopidogrel and other drugs less commonly. So sometimes things like penicillins and cephalosporins, antihistamines, nitroglycerin, or others. It's loud. I think somebody opened the door. Or it's just Rick yelling, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. I'm gonna just do the slide over. Yeah. Uh, were they talking at 499? Uh, I'm not sure. No, I don't need to do 499. Okay. It's 500. They weren't okay. talking to mine. Okay. Oh, should we start? Uh, I don't know should we just wait till Dave gets down here? Yeah. Yeah. I'll stretch. We only got 27 slides left. Yes. That's good. Daddy needs to work on van kind tomorrow. What's that? I said I got to work on a van tomorrow. <laughs> well, we need to go through mail. All right, we'll go through mail and then I'll work on We haven't on the gone through mail in three months. Yeah. Mail? Yeah. We, we just have a stack. We, like, we pitch the junk mail and we just have this giant stack of mail and hopefully there's nothing important in there. No, yeah, this, just this like is, magazines. This is, this is the remainder of the real mail. Oh, no, there mail. are bills. There are definitely yeah, bills. there are probably bills in there. Because we got a message from somebody who's like, I sent you a bill. And we're like, why didn't you text it to us? Right, right. <laughs> you know. Right, it's 2021, right. bro. It's 2021. Why are you Venmo sending it in the mail? You, you know? Nobody I checks it. Yeah, that right. <laughs> right. I don't know. That's it. So that was a weird thing. I went up and your mom and her sister and Dan were all in the kitchen. 
No one else was near. But it was Rick. It was Rick's voice. It was, okay, I don't know where he walked off to. Oh, okay. And I couldn't find him. So he All right. Come back. He might do it again. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. It's okay. I've, I've good ears. When I, yeah. I, yeah. I heard it. I did hear it too. And I was yeah. Do you, do you want me to just go wait up there and intercept him? I, no, yeah, let's keep if, going. We if have we 27 hear, slides, so we we'll probably get it we're, done. We're almost done. And if we hear him, we'll just pause. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so, what about the role of platelets in purpura? Again, if you have non palpable purpura, that usually means you have low platelets or dysfunctional platelets. If you have palpable purpura, that's a different ballgame. That's usually angiopathy or one of the leukocytoclastic, leukocytoclastic vasculitides. So what are some causes of dysfunctional platelets, which, by the way, would increase the bleeding time? A functional but rarely performed platelet test. Aspirin, which inhibits platelets for the life of the platelet, so 8 to 12 days. NSAIDs, which work as long as they're in the bloodstream. Uh, P2Y12 inhibitors, such as clopidogrel, and other drugs less commonly, so penicillins, cephalosporins, nitro, antihistamines, and a few others. Okay, so what's some etiology of purpura? So this is a, a great diagram that breaks non-palpable purpura and palpable purpura. So as Aaron had mentioned, palpable, palpable purpura, you want to think about vasculitis. And then non-palpable purpura, they break it down to less than three millimeters, like petechiae, and then greater than five millimeters with ecchymosis, and then various etiologies for that. How about ITP or immune thrombocytopenic purpura? So uh, it's always immune, and it's sometimes idiopathic. This is an immune destruction of platelets that's triggered by an unknown antigen. Uh, you have a low platelet count, but you don't have any other abnormal labs. And so you can't really make this diagnosis until you've excluded other cytopenias. The pediatric version peaks around age 5 and affects both sexes equally. And it's a sudden onset of petechiae purpura several weeks after an infectious illness. Most of these cases resolve within 6 months, and they generally do quite well without treatment. Then there's the adult version. That's insidious in onset. It can be very chronic, mostly affects women. There's a genetic propensity in certain families. And some of these patients are chronically dependent on platelet transfusion when their platelet counts get too low and maybe on steroids or immunomodulators for a really long time. So what's some treatment? So we want to treat patients. Uh, so if the platelet count is less than 30,000, um, that would be an indication for treatment. If you have active bleeding, 30 to 50,000, um, you can treat in those situations. Or if there's a major concern like intracerebral hemorrhage, particularly in elderly patients. So how are we going to treat them? Well, we want to suppress the immune response. So steroids are a great choice. And um, you can also use high-dose anti-D immune globulin, um, which can work within hours. So, but this can only be given to RH positive patients, but it can be more efficacious, um, but also more expensive than steroids. Okay, DIC. So this is a uh, consumptive coagulopathy, generally an extrinsic pathway problem. It's most commonly caused by the liberation of tissue factor. Now you get these small ineffective clots in the microcirculation that are consuming all your clotting factors. Um, and this can cause tissue hypoxemia, and then you get elevated products of fibrinolysis, such as FDPs or fibrin degradation products, and one of those is the D-dimer. Causes, well, famously meningococcemia. That's sort of the most extreme form of DIC, this purpura fulminans syndrome. Head trauma can do this. Uh, when you get a brain injury, you can release thromboplastin into circulation and cause DIC. Sepsis, retained POCs, um, or uh, bleeding and massive transfusion, you can get into a DIC-type picture. So DIC signs, you can have either bleeding predominant or thrombosis predominant DIC. Again, the purpura fulminans uh, syndrome classically associated with meningococcemia, multi-system organ failure. Lab findings, so both PT and APTT will generally be high, uh, low platelet count, low fibrinogen level. Remember that the fibrinogen that your liver is making is being consumed. And then elevated fibrin degradation products and D-dimer from all these clots that are forming and simultaneously undergoing thrombolysis. And then fragmented RBCs. How do you treat this? So the treatment is to treat the underlying problem, right? If it's primarily bleeding manifestations, the best te single test to follow in this setting is the prothrombin. Um, you want to give prothrombin complex concentrates to reverse bleeding predominant DIC. You can replace FFP if the PT is prolonged and give vitamin K and folate. You may give platelets if needed as well. If there's primarily thrombosis, uh, people have used heparin in that case. 
So let's talk about thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So TTP, it's similar to uh, DIC. You have five clinical features that you look for. So you can have thrombocytopenia, you can get hemolytic anemia, um, you can get renal failure and fever. And then the thing that kind of distinguishes TTP is neurodeficits that you can see. Um, the picture that they're showing you on the slide over there is schistocytes. And so it's these helmet cells. And that indicates this um, microangiopathic hemolytic hemolytic anemia. So um, what's the pathology there? So you get systemic damage to endothelial cells. This can lead to release of von Willebrand's factor, and you get this consumptive thrombocytopenia. And so you can have small thrombi that are occluding arterials and heart, lung, kidneys, and this can lead to end organ damage. So in many cases, it's idiopathic, but you can also see it as drug-induced or in pregnancy or infection. So how do we treat this? We're going to treat this with steroids. You do plasma exchange or FFP. You want to avoid platelet transfusion because it can actually aggregate the thrombosis. So that's a key thing to remember. In TTP, you do not want to give platelets. This next slide here, um, this summarizes uh, the, the differences between HUS, TTP, and DIC. HUS, that's easy because it's children, right? So if you hear it's in a kid, that's what you want to think about. And then the difference between TTP and DIC is with TTP, you're going to see this predominantly CNS manifestation. Um, HUS, kids typically do well. TTP, poorer. And then DIC, um, you know, these patients can be super sick. Okay, let's uh, talk about hemophilia. So hemophilia A is the most common variant. That's a factor eight deficiency. That's about 85% of cases. And it's one per 10,000 live male births. Remember that this is an X-linked recessive disorder as is hemophilia B. And so females are carriers and they have 50% of the normal clotting factor, whereas males can be affected with uh, homozygous disease. Hemophilia B is a factor nine deficiency. That's the other 15% of cases. And that occurs in about one per 25 to 35,000 live male births. So what are some common bleeding sites? Well, joints, that's fairly common, right? Because of falls, bumps. And the problem is that you can get destruction of these joints with time. And this is a chronic exposure of cartilage to blood lysis um, and also soft tissue, right? We really worry if there's a soft tissue injury in the neck, right? We worry about airway compromise. Uh, retroperitoneal bleeding can sometimes be occult and harder to pick up. And then when it comes to extremities, um, you've got to worry about compartment syndrome. So just remember Remember the five P's that we talked about earlier. What about uh, hemophilia tests? So usually there's a normal PT, an increased APTT, and if you can get factor levels in a timely fashion at your hospital, you would find decreased levels of factor nine or factor eight. How do we treat these patients? So you want to have a low threshold for factor replacement or desmopressin if there's any CNS um, complaint whatsoever. Um, so desmopressin can cause release of von Willebrand's factor um, from the endothelium. And this can increase the amounts of von Willebrand factor, which allows um, factor eight to be carried in the plasma. And so this increases um, its survival time. So this is certainly an option. Von Willebrand disease is actually the most common inherited coagulation disorder, so it affects 1% or so of the population. Uh, lots of variants of the disorder, and most patients that have Von Willebrand disease actually don't have a clinical bleeding disorder. Only about 1 in 10,000 do. So remember that Von Willebrand factor facilitates platelet activation, and it carries factor eight, as Jess mentioned, in the plasma. So the trigger to this process is exposure to platelets to the subendothelial tissue. So you've had some vessel wall damage here. Again, the PT is usually normal, but if you test a bleeding time, you'll find that it's prolonged because it's a platelet function test. And the APTT is also increased in about half of the cases. The treatment is desmopressin, which induces a release of von Willebrand factor from those storage sites in the endothelium. And then you can get a factor eight concentrate, which contains large amounts of von Willebrand factor. 